Yeah. It's failure February. <laughs> I always fail at spelling the word February. So do I. February. February. Welcome to Biomechanics on Our Minds. My name is Melissa Boswell. And my name is Melissa Boswell. <laughs> and I did that joke before. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Hannah O'Day. And we are graduate students at Stanford University and love biomechanics. <laughs> yeah, we do. It's always on our minds. <laughs> <laughs> and this podcast is brought to you by the International Society of Biomechanics. Welcome to Boom. Where we have biomechanics on our minds. Boom. Boom. We got some pretty exciting interviews today. Well, it's one interview with two people. That's multiple interviews. (laughs) Yes, that is. Uh, And they were really great. We talked to two experts on failure. And I think the failure sharing has been one of my favorite parts of Boom. So it was really exciting to get to talk to these two experts who actually know a lot about failure and how it can contribute to success and how to think about it and things like that. So we'll get into that a little bit later. Before we get into the interview, we will share a little bit of biomechanics, a little bit of boom. 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 Over... Winter break, I went home to Ohio and I went to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History for a special exhibit called Built to Survive Biomechanics. And I was super pumped that they had an an awesome biomechanics exhibit. So I went with a friend from undergrad. We did we studied biomechanics together. And um, there's a couple facts that I found pretty interesting. So I thought I would share them with you. I would love to hear. The first one is about the flying, the paradise flying snake. So on the ground, this flying snake just looks like any old snake. Um, But when it actually can glide for hundreds of feet. What? And yes, in the air, like normally if a tree jumped or if a tree normally if a tree jumped, <laughs> something would be really wrong. <laughs> normally, if a snake jumps out of a tree, it just falls to the ground. But these snakes can can glide. It's actually because when they get ready to jump, they can open up their rib cage and become what? flat, and so then they're able to glide through the air. Their rib cage. Yeah, yeah. What? Their rib cage just hinges open, what? so their stomach catches more air, and then creates lift so it slows its fall basically its body is a really long wing (laughs) just a single wing just just one skinny old wing i wonder if they can do that to help them eat like you know how some snakes like unhinge their jaw so they can like fit like a giant in their mouth i wonder if they unhinge their like ribs so that they can like oh no i wish i could do that yeah thanksgiving would be a whole different yeah (laughs) (laughs) the other one that i found really fascinating is spiders <gasps> it, is it is a spider so spiders only have muscles on the insides of their legs and when something dies muscles go yeah. into rigor mortis there they contract and so since spiders only have muscles on the insides of their legs when spiders die they do all their legs like bunch up inside oh, of their why. body that's why all the little spiders that you see just like all curled up, that's how you know it's dead. Yeah. And its legs are all Exactly. Like that. And the reason they're able to move them outward when they're alive is because they push water into their legs that expand no. them out. But then when they die, they lose all that water and then their muscles contract. And so then they're just what? bring them right in their body. What? Yeah. Isn't that a weird fact? Well, if I just like used a hair dryer and dried out a spider, it would probably die. Or just to be a mobile. <laughs> if you put a spider in the microwave to dry it out, it'll probably die. That was my question. <laughs> or if you hit it with a hair dryer for an extended time, it'll probably die. If I dry die. the spider's hair, then will it die? Well, first it will fly away, and then you won't be able to find it. <laughs> and you'll probably f- it'll probably fly into your bed and then bite you. Uh, so that's why no. you never dry a spider with a hair dryer. Uh, and now you know biomechanics. Biomechanics. <laughs> Built to survive. Thanks for that bit of boom, Melissa. That was super informative, and now I know (laughs) 
What to look for when I see snakes flying, trees jumping, and spiders' <laughs> legs curled up. <laughs> So today on Boom, we are here with Professor Jennifer Heemstra, who is an Associate Professor of Chemistry, um, and she's at Emory, and we also have one of members of her lab, Meredith Henry, who has a PhD in Developmental Psychology and is in the Heemstra Lab at Emory as well. And they are, the Heemstra Lab itself is actually focused on harnessing you know, forgive us because we're biomechanists, but um, (laughs) our description that we have is that they're focused on harnessing the molecular recognition and self-assembly properties of nucleic acids for applications in biosensing and bioimaging. But we're especially excited to have them here because they are going to talk to us about one of our favorite topics on Boom, as you all know, uh, which is failure. And we have two experts in failure and embracing failure and learning about it. So we're really excited to talk to you guys and thank you a lot for coming on with us. Thanks for having us. So usually when we ask professors or somebody that's on the podcast or what's their biggest failure, the first thing that they almost always say is there's no such thing as failure. And um, it's been kind of this recurring answer <laughs> for us, which like in some ways we understand, but I'm interested in hearing your perspective on what it means to fail and and how you think we can embrace it, um, but accept that maybe it, you know it it is <laughs> a failure of sorts. You know, it's funny as you read that question, I I didn't think oh there's no such thing as failure. I thought how do I choose because there's so many I can't possibly think through all of these and decide which one was the biggest. Um, yeah, there's just so many, and I think. Something that in our education research, we've actually really had to think about a little bit is what, how do we define failure? You know, failure doesn't necessarily have to mean, you know, literally failing a class or, you know, literally failing out of graduate school. And so uh, where we've landed is that failure is just getting an outcome that you didn't expect. So if you expected an A and you got an A minus, um, you're going to view that as a failure. Or if you expected your experiment to work and then it didn't, or it gave you a different result than you expected, um, then that's a failure. And, and psychologically, we have to cope with them not getting what we expected. Right. What are some ways that you found are helpful to cope with, with when you find out <laughs> or feel that you've had some failure? I think just like Jen said, having that attitude about it and helping to redefine, you know, that as a failure, you know, so often, you know, we kind of joke around here, you know, oh, um, the F word is failure, you know, is it something bad is inherently, you know, it's inherently negative. Um, But if you can see it instead that when we have these unexpected setbacks and challenges, you know, they're not indicative of any any um, sort of, they're not saying anything about yourself. They're not inherently about your character or your ability, uh, but they're just showing you where the next step may be or where there's an area for improvement. You know, when you were asking that question about failures, my first thought was, you know, I've been working on uh, trying to do these new stats analyses recently and self-teaching myself this program. And it just seems like I'm working myself from error message to error message and trying to learn it. Um, and so those are, those are in essence failures, right. And challenges, but you know, and seeing that, okay, well, what does each one of these teach me and how to get to, to where I ultimately want to go. And I'll just uh, add in quick to you that, yeah, I think really one of the, the great ways that we can cope with failure is just, you know, accepting that it's something that happens to everyone and that everyone kind of battles those negative feelings that come with it. You know, if you're feeling down because something didn't work out, you're not alone in that. It it can be kind of an isolating feeling if you feel like everyone else is succeeding. Um, But really, everyone feels that from time to time. Um, And for me personally, it's this idea of like failure is just so instructive. You know, I had something yesterday that failed um, or I failed at and I felt so crummy afterwards. I just thought, oh, how did I... How did I blow that? And but then in the aftermath of it, thinking about it, I thought, you know, okay, if I pick that apart and really think about why, why did that fail? 
why did that not work? Um, the lessons I gleaned from that are just going to be so incredibly valuable going forward. Yeah, I think that's huge to be able to like take that step back and kind of have that reflection. I think that I find myself like I often don't do that reflection, even if I feel like I've succeeded. Um, But I think it's so important to like kind of have that like we are always learning and things like that. But very rarely, at least do I (laughs) kind of come back and think about that learning process and like, you know, where I went wrong or, you know, um, really the benefits of going wrong and, and um, learning from that. So. um. Yeah. And you, you hit on something super brilliant there that, that we need to not only do autopsies on our failures, we need to do autopsies on our successes as well. Um, And, and we don't do that even though it actually could be so fun. Right. Um, But, and that's something we need to do. So one of the things we experience sometimes is this like paralysis when we're, scared of failure. And there was an interesting um, quote that you tweeted from AJ Santiago Lopez that said, fear of failure can damage your productivity by inducing analysis paralysis. And that that inaction comes from overthinking what needs to be done to achieve one's goals. And I thought that quote was just really interesting. And I was wondering if you could unpack that a little bit for us and and share your thoughts on it. Yeah, absolutely. So that's uh, that exact concept, I love his quote there. It's so great. Um, and it really captures why our lab got into mindset. Um, you know, our lab never set out to say we need to have an education research program. Um, this actually started because I started reading about Carol Dweck's work on mindset and realized that from this fixed mindset, if, you know, In the fixed mindset, you really don't have any potential to improve. And so failure is just this brick wall. You have no path forward from it. Whereas from the growth mindset, you always have a path forward. And so when I kind of overlaid that onto what that means for a research program in chemistry research, you know, something like anywhere from 50 to 95% of our experiments are going to fail. And she actually makes a point in her book that If you are going into something knowing that there's this high risk of failure, but you have this fixed mindset, um, then you're very likely to not do the experiment at all, um, or almost even worse, you might do something subtly wrong on purpose, setting up the experiment consciously or subconsciously, but you might self-sabotage because then what that does from that fixed mindset is that if it fails, you have something to fall back on. You can say, well... I kind of knew it wasn't going to work because there was something wrong with it. It isn't me because you just can't, there's no kind of psychological ability to accept what happens when something goes wrong and it is on you. And, and there's actually a really powerful quote in her book from uh, Nadia Salerno Sonnenberg, and I'm not going to get it quite right, but it's something like, you know, knowing that you gave it your best and still failed like how how hard is it to know that you gave it your best and still failed? Um, and from the fixed mindset, you just can't do that. And so that's actually what really inspired us to get into this area. I read that, thought about what that means for our research program, and then went out and bought a copy of the book for every single person in my lab um, and said, hey, let's do a professional development activity around this as a whole group. Um, and we talked about it. And we talked about our experiences with failure and our, our feelings, and our struggles with kind of fixed mindset, but then times we've had a growth mindset. Um, And the really fun thing is that it's just become kind of part of our lab culture. And then it was only after that that we realized, oh, we need to bring this into the classroom as well. Right. And just to give a little bit of background for maybe people who don't know as much about mindset and fixed versus growth mindset, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but so fixed mindset, I believe, is like when you kind of think that people have these innate talents and abilities and that's what you're born with you know what you're capable of and that's kind of, it limits it. But then a growth mindset is kind of the thinking that you can continue to get better at things um, if you work hard enough, or I guess it kind of speaks for itself that you can continue to grow. Am I capturing the differences between those mindsets? Yeah, absolutely. Um, The only kind of finer point I'll put on, that was was spot on as far as really thinking about the the dichotomy between how you view your abilities. Um, The only thing, I'll add quickly to that is that in the fixed mindset, it's this idea that not just are you born with different talents and abilities, but that alone defines your success. Like you are born with essentially a set of numbers that define your ability and you just walk around with that set of numbers, your genetically encoded abilities. 
And that is, you know, the only thing you can do, you know, hard work, nothing will improve. Whereas from the growth mindset, I think you, we can still recognize that people are born with, you know, different strengths in different areas. Like, you know, personally for me, you know, math came a little bit easier to me than probably for some other people, but like dancing, I am just, I can practice and practice, practice. Um, and it's way harder for me than it is for a lot of other people. But um, the story behind that though, is that you can still improve um, a lot through hard work and through positive strategies, like getting coaching. And so I actually have this funny story where I was so bad at dancing and my group was really into a video game that involved dancing on the Xbox. And I was like, burned me up that I was so bad at it. So I went and like bought an Xbox and started practicing. And even though I'm horribly uncoordinated, <laughs> I have absolutely no rhythm, I actually got pretty good at it. You know, and no, I'm not going to be a professional dancer anytime soon. Um, you know, I'm very happy in my chemistry world. Um, but the idea that, you know, you still acknowledge that there's different starting points for your abilities. And there are some things that are a little bit naturally easier to you than others. Um, but kind of the range of achievement levels that you can create through your hard work and um, willingness to seek out help and coaching and, and have this growth mindset, um, that that range is much, much larger than we think. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, uh, Jen, that you're making. Um, Carol Dweck herself has written a few things about how when people misunderstand growth mindset, that sometimes the misunderstanding that they make is that what growth mindset is saying is that, oh, well, if you just try hard enough, you know, you can do practically anything, which is just sort of an oversimplification. But what that's really getting at is saying that, like Jim said, we all can get to sort of a better part or a, a higher level of skill than sort of where we start at if we not only put the work in, but also maybe approach things from a different uh, perspective and change up what we're doing. I know um, a lot of uh, when I teach, a lot of my students, when they come to me, they're like, well, you know, I don't understand why my test grades aren't getting any better. I'm, I'm studying, you know, so hard. I'm studying for hours and trying to explain to them, yes, but how are you studying? You know, there are different approaches that you might want to look at and change up uh, the way that you're doing things, you know, as opposed to just reading your textbook and your notes over and over again changing things so that, you know, you're engaging with material at a deeper level. Um, that's the kind of thing that's sort of involved with this. So like kind of um, Meredith, speaking to your work with your students and, and Jen as well, um, your work in education research, like um, I'm just trying to think about like a lot of our boom listeners are graduate students. And um, I know Melissa and I have talked a lot about failure and kind of struggling and these different mindsets even. But um, it, I think it'd be awesome to hear what you guys have learned from that research that could help students like us and, and students that are listening. Because I think that all of us being in grad school, uh, we've learned that data speaks. So if, <laughs> if you guys have some cool data or some cool findings that you'd like to share, that'd be awesome. Yeah, our, our data analysis is you know still relatively young. We um, did have come up with two different interventions so far that we've put in classrooms, one for lecture courses that um, ask students to actually look back at old exam questions and look at, well, here's a question that I got right. You know, what was I thinking when I answered this question? You know, really breaking down, uh, as Jen said, almost, you know, doing an autopsy on you know, why did I get this question right? And then contrasting that with a question they thought they got right, but got wrong. And then um, what that's doing is encouraging something we call sort of metacognition. So thinking about the way that we think. Um, and the hope is that we'll be able to encourage students to engage a little bit more in thinking about, you know, the way they can learn and how even if they're getting questions wrong, even if, you know, don't just get that test back and be like, oh, I got that question wrong. You know, I don't want to really even look at that. That makes me upset. But take that time, look at it and be like, OK, this question didn't go so well. Uh, let me look at it. Let me see maybe what was underlying that. So then maybe I could alter something in the future. Um, so that's for our lecture classes and then in lab classes, 
Uh, well, Jen, you taught that uh, intervention this fall, so. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that and then I'll, I'll speak kind of to the graduate student experience and how it can play onto that. And so, yeah, we have, um, we teach these lab classes called course-based undergraduate research experiences. So there's students who are enrolled in a lab class, but we're doing real research. And so, you know, just like it's real research, so it has real failure. And so we design an intervention stream um, that just helps students to process through that failure and encourages them to adopt a growth mindset in that failure. And so as part of that, they uh, watch a video um, from previous students in the class talking about failure and, and kind of talking about how, you know, yeah, everyone fails. It's it's normal because I, I think that's one of the hardest things when you start in a research lab, you, you might not have been in a situation where you have that kind of failure and and it's easy to think oh this is just me I'm alone in this you know this is happening because I'm just bad at science um, and really normalizing it and talking about it um, helps you to realize that that you're not alone everyone's facing it it's actually really interesting kind of the parallel between that and the mental health crisis that's facing graduate students as well that 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 also is just so extremely isolating and, and just talking about it and knowing you're not alone is, is kind of one of the first steps to making things better. And so in this lab intervention, the students watch a video um, of previous students talking about how, yeah, we failed and then we overcame it. Um, and then they do a series of reflective writing statements, just really thinking through, you know, how does it feel to fail? Um, what do you, can you anticipate failure in the future and kind of emotionally prepare yourself for that? And then um, later they look back on, you know, when I anticipated the failure, um, did that improve my ability to cope with it? Um, and we don't have the data process yet for that to know how that impacted students, um, but we're going to be doing that in the next couple of months and we're really excited to see what that yields. Um, I'll also speak to the graduate student experience quick if that's okay. Yeah, please. Okay, cool. Yeah, and so you're absolutely right. You know, as a graduate student, you're in this high pressure environment where you have a limited amount of time in order to create the scholarly record of research. And um, in a lot of ways, that is what will set the trajectory of your future. And so so definitely that's a really high pressure situation. It might feel like, oh, how can we be embracing failure when failure is you know, materially going to hurt us in this situation? And um, yeah, that's something we really need to, to own and recognize. I think we don't want to discount it and say, oh, yeah, you know, you have the freedom to go and fail all you want and it'll be totally fine. Um, you know, there, there is a very real thing that you have to get research done. Um, but what Carol Dweck has found in her research um, is that essentially being afraid of failure or having a negative response to failure actually makes you more likely to fail. Um, and embracing failure counterintuitively makes you more likely to succeed. And the two quick examples of that are the one I talked about earlier, where if you're afraid of failure, you might not set up the experiment or you might set up the experiment wrong or you might not set up quite the right experiment um, because of that fear of failure. And now, you know, if you're messing up your own experiments, you're you're definitely not doing yourself any favors and, and you're less likely to succeed ultimately. Um, and then the other place that, that I see it too is, um, and I see this as an advisor, is that if you have a fixed mindset and you have something fail in lab, you know, the last thing you want to do is go talk to your research advisor about it. Because you're like, oh man, this means I'm bad at science. Then if I go tell my advisor, they're going to know that I'm, you know, bad at science because that fixed mindset again just says it failed because I'm bad at something, not it failed because it's research or it failed because there's something I need to learn. Um, whereas the growth mindset says, yeah, it failed because it's research and research is hard or it failed because there's some new thing that I need to learn. And so having that growth mindset allows students to go and seek help. It allows students to go to their colleagues, to go to their research advisor, to go to other faculty members and say, hey, I had this experiment that didn't work. Um, can we sit down and talk about what might have gone wrong and talk about what we might be able to do in the future to make it work? Um, and I think pretty much 100% of the time, going and talking to people about an experiment that didn't work and getting advice for moving forward is ultimately going to lead to more success than just you know holding on to that and trying to solve the problem yourself. Well, I was just gonna throw another thought on there as someone that's a little bit earlier you know, on in my career and trying to transition from grad student into faculty, um, I know that having sort of this 
idea, uh, this awareness of fixed versus growth mindset, trying to, you know, graph with that in my own life, which, you know, we all struggle with, right? Uh, sometimes we have these conversations in the hall, Jen and I and other members of our team with, oh, yeah, I got stuck in a fixed mindset today. Um, but uh, knowing that that's um, a thing to work on, I think, can help make you then, it can help you succeed as a student, but then I also think it will help you um, be aware of what might be going on with students to help you as you're transitioning into that more advisory role. Um, and then to encourage that in your students. Because, you know, I know um, the fact that Jen found this and brought it to her students and then uses it and encourages it so much in everyone in the group, it certainly has a big impact on our culture and environment that is, you know, pretty uh, amazing to see. The funny thing about bringing it to our group is that I call it meta mindset, right? I was terrified of bringing this to our group and I was terrified of starting to do education research because I thought, I don't know what I'm doing. What if I fail at it? And I was like, oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really awesome that you brought it to your group. And then we saw that you're also bringing it to more of a, to a bigger audience with FlameNet. Yeah, so FlameNet stands for Failure is a Part of Learning, a Mindset Education Network. Um, and the way that FlameNet came about, this is my you know meta mindset story, is that when our lab was moving to Emory, I had been doing some stuff around mindset and fear of failure, obviously in our lab for a while, I'd started to bring that into my classes. And I thought, you know, it would be really great to kind of do this better. You know, I'm not an education researcher. I'm certainly not a psychologist. Um, so I'm kind of doing the best I can, but I'm sure that these interventions I'm doing in my classes could be much better. And then it was starting to get attention and support from other people in the community saying, oh, I want to do that too. So we thought, okay, let's do this better and let's do this broader. You know, let's make really great interventions that are uh, really ev evidence-based and rigorous. Let's assess them and make sure that they're actually creating the changes in psychology and mindset that we want them to. And then let's get that out to as many STEM instructors as possible um, to get these kind of into the hands of students then and, and get them impacting students. Okay. So the, the audience for this is more like instructors to make sure that they are aware and can disseminate that to their students. Yeah, exactly. We wanted to um, develop these interventions. And so our thought was, you know, we can hire a postdoc and then, you know, just do stuff with my classes. But that's kind of, you know, boring and small. So I thought, well, why don't we just, and this is my growth mindset story. I never would have been able to do this from a fixed mindset. I thought, well, why don't we just start from zero and start this as a nationwide collaborative of faculty who are interested in this topic? And um, we got together and planned a workshop in about a year ago, spring 2018. Um, we brought everyone into Atlanta, about 15 people, and we, over a couple of days, more or less designed some interventions, and then we refined them. And then most of those faculty used kind of these interventions we talked about, these lab reflections or the exam debrief in their classes throughout this academic year. And then Meredith and her colleague Shayla are collecting all of those data and analyzing them to see what impact we're having on students. Um, and then this year, we're really excited. We have funding um, we got from the National Science Foundation that's allowing us to expand that network. And so we're expanding up to about 40 members for our workshop this spring. Um, and the idea is really just that we want to do something that will impact students in a positive way. And we want it to get traction among faculty. You know, you can design the coolest thing to do in your classroom, but if faculty don't actually want to use it, it's not going to go anywhere. And so our hypothesis was, let's just get all the stakeholders in the room. You know, let's get psychologists who really understand these frameworks and want to see, you know, mindset implemented correctly. Let's get education researchers who can tell us, you know, what makes for a good kind of intervention during your classroom. Let's get the STEM instructors, people like me who are, you know, the boots on the ground in the classroom teaching students. Um, and then this year, we're also adding uh, some graduate students because they represent uh, the teaching assistants who are also interacting heavily with the students. Um, and then they're also much closer to kind of the undergraduate student experience to really speak for the undergraduates as stakeholders in all of this. And our goal is that just by getting all of these stakeholders together 
and getting everyone involved in the process of designing these interventions will create something that's really evidence-based and effective, but also that instructors want to use and students are kind of excited to participate in. Can anyone apply to attend the workshop? Yeah, yeah. So we, we've closed our applications for this year, but we're uh, putting in a proposal right now for renewed NSF funding. And um, so hopefully we'll be doing a conference again in 2020. And yeah, absolutely. Um, anyone who's kind of a stakeholder in this process. And so, you know, faculty, psychology researchers, education researchers, graduate students. Um, we have some program personnel who run summer research programs. Um, academic leaders, so administrators. So yeah, really anyone who kind of is a stakeholder and has a hand in this. Um, and I will say though that anyone can join FlameNet. Um, so you can go to our website um, and join and we are creating an online community there to discuss these topics and we welcome anyone who wants to to be a part of that community. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And especially to our Boom listeners, I think that um, if they can get involved and in, um, hopefully in the, the workshop or conference that you are able to host next year as well, um, and I mean, Melissa and I would love to follow up with you. Uh, we, we were just looking now that the workshop is in May. So we'd love to follow up and see how, how it goes afterwards. Because I think that we've been thinking about trying to um, integrate some tools or some kind of discussion, really start a discussion here um, at Stanford um, in our community around these topics. And it'd be awesome to be equipped with some tools and sort of best practices that you guys have been developing as well. Yeah, no, we'd love to talk to you afterwards, too. And, you know, we haven't, um, you know, I, I have things that I do within my own group um, and our collaborative hasn't really branched into graduate education yet. But there's certainly ways in which our members are bringing um, these ideas into graduate education. So I'll, sometimes I go on seminars. I'll also give a talk about embracing failure. Or I'll give webinars in different places around that that are really aimed at graduate students. Um, and it's it's an exciting group. It's it's really fun to talk to graduate students because they're you're on both sides of this. You know, you're a student in the lab really confronting his failure, or maybe in your classes, but often graduate students are also TAs. So they're teaching undergraduates who are having to confront these things. Um, and so yeah, we'd we'd be excited to talk about that. I will also um, say so if anyone is interested in learning more about FlameNet or wants to be involved in the future, um, the easiest way to get involved is you can follow us on Twitter at Failure Mindset or uh, search FlameNet on Twitter. Um, and then that will also take you to our web page. And there's a member section on the web page where anyone who'd like to can join and become part of the community. Also, um, like Jim was saying, we expect this research we're doing to have an impact outside of our collaborative. And to that end, um, we've written a review of some of these uh, psychological educational principles that we've been talking about. So things like growth mindset, fear of failure, coping skills, and our ideas of how they might all fit together to like impact student behavior. And we're sort of thinking about them at the undergraduate level, but I absolutely think they could, you know, be implemented at the graduate level or that graduate students could get a lot out of them. Um, so uh, that is going to be coming up in uh, the acceptance of publication. It's going to be in a future issue of CBE Life Sciences Education. Uh, so that might be something, too, if your listeners want to find out just some more about some of these principles without having to dig too deep in them, but to learn more about some of these things and how they might all fit together within this paradigm. Yeah, the review is really written for scientists and engineers. Kind of the bar was, you know, can I, can Jen understand these frameworks by reading this? Because I'm not a psychologist. I don't have background education research. You know, I'm just, I'm a scientist. I'm trained as a scientist, um, but I'm excited to learn more about this. And so we really aimed the review for um, people like us as scientists and engineers who really see how mindset and fear of failure can impact students and want to learn more, but without having to go get a degree in psychology or education research first. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And one of the things that I think summarizes what we've talked about really well and um, is a tweet that you had about your superpowers. And I think this applies to both you and Meredith as one of your superpowers is 
um, maintaining a short attention span to move past failure and rejection. But then my favorite part is that the next sentence says, the great thing is that these aren't special to me. Anyone can have them, which I think really sums up the whole the growth mindset on being able to learn from failure. Thank you so much for talking with us. It's It's been really fascinating and I'm excited to share this with others. This has really been a unique boom interview. Usually we're talking about, you know, different <laughs> muscle tendon dynamics, but um, <laughs> um, I think that our listeners will really appreciate this. And it's um, it's so awesome hearing like all of these things coming from people that are standing where we want to be someday. So I really appreciate um, your humility, your insight and, um, and your wisdom. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the chance to be here. I really appreciate what you're doing for the scientific community with having this podcast and talking about cool science, but then also talking about failure. And like I said, I, I think it's it's so hard to feel as a graduate student like you're alone in, fail, in failing. And by just talking about it and normalizing it, we can make so much progress and, and make academia a better place to be. Thanks again to Jen and Meredith for such a great interview and for teaching us so much about failure and mindset um, and how that can really impact our lives as graduate students. Yeah, it's really nice to know that people are thinking about this, and I feel like they could relate to a lot of the things that have gone through my mind as a grad student, and that's just always super comforting to know someone else thinks that yeah, way. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> And we talked a lot about mindset and the growth mindset and some of Carol Dweck's research, who is actually here at Stanford in psychology, about growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And I actually, I didn't know this, but she ran a study where she investigated the effect of praise on performance and how this could lead to a growth or fixed mindset. And in a cohort of children, she administered an easy IQ test and then after that praised them in one of two ways for their high scores. So she either said, oh, you must be really smart and praised their intelligence, or she said, you must have worked really hard and praised their effort. And so that was groups one and two. And afterwards, all of the children were asked to do a second test and were given the option of doing either a similar test or one that was more challenging. And depending on how they were praised, if the children were pra praised for their effort, if they were in group two, they were three times as likely to actually choose the harder test in comparison to the children who were praised for their intelligence, the ones that were in group one. And the children were then given a test that was difficult and beyond their skill level. And those who were praised for their efforts actually worked harder on the test and enjoyed the process, while the children who were praised for being smart, they just gave up early and became frustrated. And the, mm, so They yeah. didn't feel like they were smart anymore. They didn't, yeah, they had, like, like their identity <laughs> had been sort of defeated. Yeah. And the most interesting part of the study was actually the fourth test, which was similar to the first easy test, so not even not more difficult. Children who were praised for being smart actually scored lower than they were on this similarly easy test as their first one. And those who were praised for their efforts scored higher than they did the first time. So there's something in that, I think, that shows just like how your mindset can affect how well you do. I think sometimes if you're expecting to do well on something, maybe you do do well. Or if you're expecting to do well but not in a in this sort of growth mindset way and this right. embrace to learning right it's um, and it's you almost can. like too when you have the mindset that it's that it's your effort that's getting you good scores that's something that you have control over versus yeah. like your intelligence maybe if you think that's something that's innate and like whether you're smart or you're not smart then that can be an obstacle when trying to take challenges mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. test how intelligent you are right because you automatically give up if you think you don't have the mm -hmm. tools or resources versus just knowing you have the effort means that you can then get those tools and resources. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thanks for listening today. You can follow the International Society of Biomechanics on Twitter at IS Biomechanics and on Facebook as well. Abstract submission just closed for... Woo! Yeah, for ISB and... The American Society of Biomechanics Combined Conference um, 2019 in Calgary. So that's really exciting. And now we can start registering. And I hope all the students want to do the fun student events that will be planned. We have a hike and um, we're going to have a student night out and a lot of fun things. 
Biomechanics Off Our Minds. Our minds.